good morning to all of you. We once again welcome you this Sunday for another webinar in our webinar series. And as usual, first to the housekeeping rules. Uh, this webinar link will be available from 9 a.m. to 9.45 a.m. for all of you to join in. And no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should have been attended till the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate for CPD points. And these CPD points are strictly adhered to the national NCCPD guidelines. These uh, rules and regulations are in place to improve and maintain the standards of our CPD program structured here in collaboration with GMOA and SHRI. And we thank you once again for joining us every week in our webinar series. And without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our topic today, something very important and very timely. This is about the practical aspects of oxygen therapy, especially focusing on emergency department. As usual, this webinar is also brought to you by the Government Medical Asso Officers Association and the Society for Health Research and Innovation. At the end of the webinar, we will be having a question and answer session. So please feel free to type in any of the queries you have during the webinar to be discussed at the end. We also kindly request you to switch off your video and also to mute your microphone during the session. Uh, today, we have a very distinguished guest uh, with us to talk about this very misused, mistrusted and mislabeled drug oxygen in our clinical practice. Uh, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Kamira Bopetta, who is the senior registrar attached to the National Hospital of Kandy. He is an MD holder in emergency medicine and also has received a membership of the Royal College of Emergency Physicians. Sir, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. So, um, so first of all, thank you for your kind introduction. So, um, today actually I'm going to discuss with you um, regarding a, a drug that is a that is actually the oldest one of the oldest drug uh, which was found in 17th century but still we are misusing underusing or overusing this drug so uh, that is oxygen so oxygen and also, this is this lecture with regards to your fifth vital sign. So that is oxygen saturation. Okay. So um, before we discuss about oxygen therapy, especially in the emergency department, this is uh, I'm, I'm not going to discuss with you uh, regarding oxygen therapy in critical care or ICU or oxygen therapy in uh, operation theaters. This is especially, uh, so how do you tackle, how do you approach, uh, how, how do you manage initially the hypoxia in the emergency department? This is the emergency physician's approach basically. So uh, before we talk about any theory part, so because this is a Sunday morning, so I would like to get more adrenaline surge in your body. So first, I would like to go through some clinical scenarios with you, just to squeeze, squeeze your adrenals in the morning. So um, first clinical scenario, so it is, uh, you have got 60, uh, you can take a, either photo something of this uh, question, clinical scenario, because we are going to discuss the answers for these clinical scenarios at the end of towards the end of this uh, presentation lecture. So first question, you have got 64 year old male, a manual worker present to the emergency department with shortness of breath. He has got background history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease with two admissions in the last two months with HU admissions for NIV, but no home oxygen therapy, no home nebulizers. He lives with his wife and he's independent man. So initial observation, saturation 74, room air, central cyanose, agitated, usual um, the COPD patients approach to our emergency department, and respirator is 45, bilateral base, he's tachycardic, normal blood pressure, and he's febrile as well, temperature 39 centigrade. So you do, your department is very busy, and you are the attending medical officer. 
you are sent us to um, to start oxygen and nebulization. So that's the reflex, uh, the spinal nerve reflex. Uh, if you come across this sort of patient, Miss, can you start some oxygen and start some nebulization? Okay. So thinking. Uh, so keeping this question one in your mind. So we'll go to the second question. Uh, yeah. So please think of the answer or the approach or how you correct hypoxia in this patient. The second question, the 69 years old male present to ED at 5 a.m. in the morning with rapidly worsening shortness of breath for a few hours. He's no longer able to lie flat. Past medical history, ischemic heart disease, ejection fraction 25, hypertension. So vital parameters, respirate 30 with widespread bilateral crepitations, he's hypoxic, he's tachycardic, he's hypertensive, afebrile, and he has good bilateral low limb Same approach, you ask the nurse to start, miss, can you start some oxygen and give some fusimide? So that's the second case. So please take a photo if you want, so then uh, you can formulate your approach, your answer to this question. So we'll discuss the answer to this question at the end. Case number three, these are different clinical scenarios you can come across in the ED. So 40 years old male present to ED with fever, cough, shortness of breath for a few days. So that's a very common presentation. Uh, Past medical is none, vitals, patient is confused, he's tachypneic, he's very, very hypoxic. He's 85 on non rebreather mask, 15 liters a minute, the maximum rate of oxygen. Right basal crepitation, he's tachycardic, fortunately, blood pressure is stable, and he's febrile. So you diagnose, he's having a right side pneumonia. Um, so you plan, you don't think he can go to the board, so you think he needs to go to ICU. So ICU is three hour drive from your emergency department. So then you decide to intubate and transfer. So how do you correct hypoxia prior to intubation? So basically, how do you tube without killing this patient? Uh, so that's question number three. Question number four, uh, is an infant, four months old infant, admitted to your ED with bronchiolitis, and he has done RSV RAC, RAC testing that was positive. So RSV related bronchiolitis. Vitals is tachypneic, subcostal recessions, nasal flaring, crackles everywhere, and room air oxygen saturation is 89. He's hypoxic, tachycardic. Luckily, circulation is all right. Capricule is two seconds. Generally, child is still alert. Uh, mom said he's feeding less than 50% of normal. So how do you correct hypoxia in this kid? So that's the fourth question. So lots of questions in the morning. Uh, fifth and last question. So you have got 70 kilogram man who's intubated due to hypoxia failure following pneumonia. You are going to transfer this patient to nearest ICU, which is one hour away. So your ventilator setting, you have got tight volume of 500, respirate of 12, and uh, FIO, the fraction of inspired oxygen is 50%, that's 0 0.5, and you have got oxyloc ventilator. So healthcare worker inquired you about the size of the oxygen cylinder you, you need. So sir, monocylinder, that we can do any male die again yonder. So grab a cylinder, whatever available. So is that your answer? So Mahar is in the Gandhi and is that your answer? So it should not be your answer. So you will be able to find the answer to this, this question at the end of this presentation. So now we will go to the proper lecture. So having some adrenaline in your blood. Uh, so objectives of this my of, the, of my presentation uh, basically. This topic is important, and we are going to discuss about oxygen delivery devices and how to prescribe oxygen, targets of oxygen in common disease conditions. And uh, at the end, we are going to discuss these cases again. So, um, is this topic important? Is, is oxygen therapy is an important topic? Is that an important topic? So, you know, too little oxygen, that is hypoxia, Everybody knows, even a laborer knows, um, 
that can kill patient. But do you know that too much, of, too much oxygen also can kill patients? So that is hyperoxia. So UK data says, so more liberal oxygen therapy increases patient mortality in hospital mortality by about 11 deaths among every thousand people exposed. And approximately, roughly like 25% of your ED patient would receive oxygen at some point during your ED stay. So that's a big number. So take home message. So next time before you dial up or before you open up the oxygen regulator knob, think, am I going to give too much oxygen or am I going to give too little oxygen? Because both are dangerous. So that's one of the take home messages in this lecture. So then what is oxygen therapy? So actually, so if you sit, sit in front of a working table fan, so do you think that you are getting um, more oxygen if you sit in front of a working table fan? No, you, you only get, the, get some form of high flow, but still you are breathing room air. So what is oxygen therapy? So oxygen therapy is administration of high concentration of oxygen. So more than the room air percentage, that more than 21%. Uh, so that is called oxygen therapy. So administration of oxygen, high concentration, greater than atmospheric air. So why do we need oxygen? It's basically to prevent hypoxia. And also we need to prevent hyperoxia as well. That means too much oxygen. So why do we need why why do we need oxygen? It's basically our cells. We need energy. So for energy production, we need oxygen. It's simple as that. So if we don't have enough oxygen, we don't get we won't, our cells won't be able to pro produce enough energy. So we won't get sufficient amount of energy. So we need oxygen for that. Okay, so now I'm going to discuss about the oxygen delivery devices very briefly. So the oxygen delivery devices, the meaning is, uh, is devices that are used to deliver oxygen to a patient. So roughly, I mean, broadly, you can categorize oxygen delivery devices as variable performance devices and fixed performance devices. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as name implies, the variable performance is, is variable. Performance are variable. So, what is the performance of uh, oxygen delivery devices is giving more, giving oxygen to the patient. So, variable performance devices delivers fluctuating level of oxygen, fluctuating level of FiO2. FiO2 means fraction of inspired oxygen. That means uh, the percentage of oxygen delivering to the patient. So variable performance devices, they can't provide fixed or known percentage of oxygen to the patient because of the characteristic, characteristics of the device. Those are called variable. Examples, the common day-to-day -day practice used one, the simple face mask, nasal cannula, partial or uh, non-rebreather mask. And fixed performance devices, I mean, it's, do you know now the, the, the meaning of this one? So it is, it, 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 the, these devices are able to provide more constant, more known, known amount of, and or the fixed amount of uh, inspired oxygen um, for a patient. So examples, venturi devices, and high flow nasal cannula, so non-invasive ventilation, non -invasive ventilation and anesthetic breathing systems. So summary, so oxygen delivery devices, so variable and fixed performance devices, variable is a simple base mask, nasal cannula, rebreathing, non-rebreathing mask, fixed 
basically what we found in our board. So the departments are venture devices, hydro and in uh, First thing I'm going to discuss. So before that, so if you think, so what are the factors that affect uh, the amount of FIO2 delivered to the patient? Uh, for example, suppose you are going to you are going to do an experiment. So you are going to give you are going to select two normal two of your friends, and you are going to give oxygen six liters per minute via a face mask to your friend named A, and you are going to do 10 liters of oxygen via face mask to uh, your friend B. So who receives more FIO2? It's basically, you, you can understand, is the, the friend is getting 10 liters of oxygen. Uh, we'll get another example. You are going to do another experiment. So, so you are, you are going to use a normal person and you are going to use a pneumonia patient with significant respiratory distress. So for a normal person, you are going to use 10 liters of um, oxygen via face mask. And for new... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, would that be all right now? Yes, that's not perfect. Thank okay, you. yeah, good, good, all right. Okay, so uh, so you are going to do an experiment. So first, for a normal person, you are going to start 10 liters a minute via face mask, and you are going to start oxygen, same amount, 10 liters via face mask to a tachypneic pneumonia patient. So who, who gets more FIO? Who gets higher FIO? So normal person get higher FIO2. That is, the, the pneumonia patient, usually they are tachypneic, so they are breathing fast. So they have got high peak inspiratory flow rate. Peak inspiratory flow rate means, so the, the, the maximum or the highest inspiratory flow uh, that are being achieved during inspiration. So usually in a normal person, it is like 10 to 20 liters per minute, but in a significantly respiratory distressed patient, it roughly goes to around 30, 40, 60 liters per minute. So you are providing only 10 liters per minute through the mask. So how can the patient get rest? So patient needs to take them from the atmospheric air. So there's a dilution of your 100% oxygen you are giving to the face mask with the atmospheric air. So then dilution, so then you, can, you are going to get low inspired oxygen percentage. So uh, take home point. So the fraction of inspired oxygen percentage or the oxygen percentage delivering to the patient it depends on the device as well as it depends on the patient factors. So device is usually the flow rate and the size of the reservoir and the, the tightly fitting the mass of the face. And the patient factors as we discussed is the respiratory rate and the peak is the flow rate. Okay. So next I'm going to discuss about, briefly discuss about the oxygen delivery uh, devices. So the first thing is a simple face mask. It's a commonly used one. So basically, uh, simple face mask. It was co also called Hudson mask, but Hudson is a company name. So Hudson, the, the, this company not only manufacture simple face mask, but they manufacture other masks as well. So please try to avoid the name Hudson mask. So use, use the simple face mask, the name simple face mask. So the simple face mask, uh, would be able to provide 40 to 60 percent of oxygen. Um, the normal rate, the normal oxygen flow rate we need to use is five to 10 liters per minute. So the take home point, never start face mask oxygen with less than five liters per minute. 
So we have seen, I mean, it's not like many occasions, um, the patients are on face mask, but they, have, they are getting only three liters per minute. That flow is not enough for the patient's proper breathing. So that leads to increased resistance as well as carbon dioxide rebreathing. So take home point, please open up your dial at least to five liters per minute next time when you are going to use a simple face mask. So um, who are the candidates for this simple face mask? I mean, you can use any patient with type 1 respiratory failure, uh, but not for the patient patients at risk of hypercapnia. That's not for the patient with COPD. Because this amount of oxygen, uh, 40 to 60 percent, is, is not good for for, a, for patients with uh, COPD because they can go into hypercapnic respiratory failure. So, but every every other patient, I mean, any other patients, not like uh, COPD, other patient with type, type 1 respiratory like pneumonia, uh, pneumothorax, um, heart failure, pulmonary embolism, septic shock, whatever, um, cardiogenic pulmonary edema or renal failure lead into uh, pulmonary congestion, you can use um, simple face mask. Uh, and the second thing is the nasal cannula. It's also variable for phone devices. Device, uh, I think it's, it's like underutilized um, um, oxygen delivery device in most of the department and the board. So nasal cannula, we can go, up, go from one liter to six liters per minute. Uh, six is a maximum, but uh, when you go beyond four liters, um, this flow needs humidification. Humidification. Um, you can achieve uh, 24 to 40 percent of oxygen, depending on the oxygen flow rate you are going to use. So this is uh, roughly a um, comparison. Uh, or the amount of uh, FIO2 you can get uh, with varying chlorine. So when we use when you use one liter per minute oxygen uh, for a nasal prong, you can get 24% of roughly uh, FIO2. So when you go up to two, you can get 20. It's like, it's like an addition of four, 24, 28, 32, 36. So um, okay, and uh, this is the face mask uh, ox, um, FIO2 um, and the flow rates. Okay, so remember when you use one liter nasal prong, you can get 24%. When you use two liters, you can get roughly 28%. So, um, what are the, who are the candidates for? Okay. So, who are the candidates for nasal prong? It's also, I mean, when we, we can use for a patient with uh, type 1 respiratory failure, that patient with hypoxia. So, like for a for patient, we use for a face mask. And nasal prongs also use, can be used for these sort of patients. Um, advantages of nasal prongs, I mean, it's very easy, it's very comfortable. Um, no claustrophobia, patient eat, patient can eat, patient can drink, patient can talk. Um, it's not going to fall like a face mask, it's very cheap, and there's no carbon dioxide rebreathing, really lots of advantages. So, and also we can use nasal prong for, for COPD, stable COPD, stable hypoxic COPD patients as well. Because um, if you use one liter, you, the patient will get only 24. If you use two liters, you can patient can get only 28. So these are the advantages of, of nasal prongs, and these are the disadvantages. When you when you're using higher flow rates, so patient can get nasal irritation. Uh, if the patient has got a blocked nose, you won't be able to use. And actual concentration of FiO2 cannot be predicted. This is only a guess, the 2428. Uh, and the third example for the for variable performance devices. Uh, partial rebreathing mask and non rebreathing mask. Okay, so what is this partial rebreathing mask and what is this non rebreathing mask? So, 
Uh, this is the difference. These are this is the, this uh, picture shows the differences between uh, partial and the non-rebreathing mass. On your left hand side, you can see the partial rebreathing mass. I mean, as the name implies, so it says there's a partial rebreathing. That means patient is breathing his expired air. Yeah. So that's called partial rebreathing. And non-rebreathing means patient is not going to breathe his expired air. Yeah. So that that means there's no mixing. Here, yeah, there's some amount of mixing. So how we are going to identify these two masks? So non -re partial rebreathing mass, you don't have um, any mass. So uh, the components of this mask, this is the mask, and you have got expiratory holes, and there's a tube connection, and this is the oxygen uh, inlet, and this is the reservoir bag. So when, uh, the patient, when the patient expires, some amount of gas, expired gas go through these holes and some amount of oxygen can go into this bag. That's why that's rebreathing. The fraction of inspired oxygen, the amount, the percentage of oxygen patient can receive, uh, usually 60 to 50 to 70% of oxygen uh, patient can receive, patient can get if you use partial rebreathing mask. Um, so if we discuss about non-rebreathing mass, so you have got two uh, valves. So one valve here is another valve. These all are one-way valves. So when patient take a deep breath, so this valve open up and patient can directly breathe from this back. Okay. And when patient take a breath, this valve closes. When patient expires, when patient exhales, this valve open up and exhales are go out. This valve, this valve into this bag. So that's why it is called non-rebreathing mask. So usually, uh, you can the you can uh, achieve. 70 to 90, 70 to 100% of FiO2 uh, inspired oxygen percentage with non rebreathing mass. Uh, take home points uh, I mean, in any patient, in any critically ill patient, even in a COPD patient, any critically ill patient at the initial stages, we can use this either one of these masks. I think it's better to go for a non the mask because we can go for the highest amount of oxygen percentage we can give. Uh, the other take home message. Um, so before you apply this mask to the patient's face, make sure that bag is filled. Both partial and non the mask. And also for partial rebreathing mass, you need at least eight liters per minute oxygen, 100% oxygen flow, at least eight. Uh, you can go up um, if the bag is partially collapsed. And for the non rebreathing mass, you need to, at least you need to start with 15 liters per minute. Okay, so those are the take home points. Um, so the, what are the complications of this uh, non rebreather partial rebreather mass? I mean, we are giving high flow oxygen, so you can get uh, corneal dryness, you can get oxygen toxicity, too much oxygen. Um, you can get a condition called resorption atelectasis or the denitrogenation atelectasis because you are going to replace uh, more and more oxygen, um, more and more nitrogen with oxygen. So the oxygen will be rapidly absorbed into the body. So then there's atelectasis. So that's called denitrogen and atelectasis. You can get it uh, if the patient is receiving 100% oxygen for a long time, especially in ICU. Uh, and sometimes you can get uh, type 2 respiratory failure in COPD patients because you are giving high percentage of oxygen. Uh, yeah, those are the complications of this uh, non rib with the partial rib with the mask. Okay. And then we are going to move. Uh, we are going to discuss about fixed performance devices, uh, basically Venturi, uh, high flow, CPAP, BiPAP, uh, or the um, acidic breathing systems. So Venturi 
uh, the venturing devices are able to provide predictable amount of um, infrared oxygen percentage. Uh, the thing you need to remember here, so you know the venturi, the Bernoulli principle. So if you can look at this blue color one, blue color venturi device on your right hand side, so you can see a tiny hole in the center. So that's where oxygen, that's where we are going to give oxygen. So when oxygen comes through this tiny hole compared to the venturi device on your left hand side, so according to the Bernoulli principle, you can generate more negative pressure. So then this can suck more air compared to this green color one. So that's why you have got this big uh, air in training hole. So, so more air suck in, so you are giving 100% oxygen two liters a minute through this hole and you are getting more air suck in to the venturi devices so more dilution so you get low fi2 so that's 24 so remember blue color venturi 24 percent and uh, so when we talk about the green color left hand side one you can see a bigger hole so less negative pressure so less air entraining to the venturi device so less mixing so you get more fio2 so that is 60 percent uh yeah so remember the blue color is 24 and green is 60 percent um so this is the same thing we have discussed and these are the colors so usually in the emergency department what we really need is 24 and 28 basically for the copd patient so 24 is blue color 28 is white color uh, remember these two as well so this is uh roughly uh, these slides um, trying to be, trying to um, make you aware about entrainment ratios. So when you look at this 24% uh, venturi, this one, the composed one, so you are going to give four liters of 100% oxygen. And if you can remember, it has got very tiny holes, so create more negative uh, pressure and it entrains more air. So the air entrainment ratio, oxygen to air is one to 25. So ultimate flow patient gets is 100 liters per minute. So if you start the patient on 24% venturi mass, that's the blue color venturi mass, the ultimate flow patient get is roughly around 100 with FIO2 of 24. And if you go down, if you see the, if you can see this 60.6, that's 60%, green color venturi. Uh, so you are going to give 100% oxygen, 20, 12 liters per minute rate. And you can see it has got big oxygen hole. It has got small uh, entraining uh, holes. So the, the entrainment is less, is only one to one. So the ultimate flow patient can get is roughly 24 to 30. But 24 is the patient will get 100 liters per minute flow. So that's important. So if you are going to use uh, green color venturi in a significantly respiratory distress uh, patient uh, with high inspiratory peak flow rates. Um, so as we discussed earlier, so the high inspiratory flow rates is roughly like uh, in a pneumonia patient, suppose it's 40 liters per minute. So patient needs at least 40 liters per minute for some time when, when he take when he inspirate. So, but the venturi is able to provide only 24, roughly 30, 30 liters per minute. So patient needs to take some amount of atmospheric air um, through the mask holes. So there's more dilution. So take home point. So if you if you are going to use uh, venturi with higher FIO2 setting. In a tachypneic patient, so you you may not be able to give uh, this fixed amount, but you will be able to give only less lesser than this one. That's the take home point. Okay, so then we are going to briefly discuss about prescription of oxygen because I mean uh, next time when you when you go to your board, when you go to emergency department, or when you go to your ICU, don't tell your nurse that, Miss, please start oxygen. Because oxygen is a drug, so you need to prescribe oxygen, except in very, very emergency situations. 
So how we are going to prescribe? It's like any drug. You need to mention the delivery devices. You are going to use nasal prong, you are going to use face mask, so you are going to use uh, venturi. And you need to make, write down the flow rate. So if suppose you are going to start nasal prongs, so write down nasal prongs, two liters a minute. And you need to mention, you must mention the target oxygen saturation rate. So for a COPD patient, you are going to go for 88 to 92, and for other patients, you are going to go for 98. So you need to mention these three things next time when you when you prescribe oxygen in your ward. I mean, then that that you are doing wonderful job to your patient. And do we need 100%? All those slides say 100% is good, 100% is not good. You don't need 100% saturation always, except in very few occasions like carbon monoxide, cyanide poisoning, and those stuff. But those are rare. But like 95% of the occasion situation, you don't need 100% oxygen. You need only like 94 to 98% saturation oxygen. So you don't need 100% 100 saturation always. Uh, okay. So then we are going to discuss targets of oxygen therapy in common disease conditions. So the first thing we are, I'm going to first uh, disease condition I'm going to discuss with you is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as we all know, so we know too much oxygen is not good for patient with COPD. So, uh, because excessive oxygen administration, administration can lead to hypercapnic respiratory failure in some COPD patients. Why? Um, I mean, the traditional answer is they have got a hypoxic drive. Is this right? Uh, that was a traditional, traditional teaching, but the current literature says that hypoxic drive related or based on explanation is not completely true in COPD patient. So uh, the current literature says actually this COPD patient has got super normal respiratory drive. So uh, please remember that. So, then what really happens? So why uh, too much oxygen is going to kill or too much oxygen is going to deteriorate our COPD patient? It's basically uh, the current explanation is is due to increased VQ ventilation perfusion mismatch. So I'm I, I'll I'll briefly explain. So what this increased VQ mismatch? Okay. So um you know it's a uh, so these COPD patients, um, they have got um, some form of chronic lung damage. So um, when you have got chronic lung, lung damage, so they have got like ventilation problems, air movement problems. So because of this uh, ventilation, or the chronic lung damage, the, their lungs, they have got hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction as a compensatory mechanism to improve their gas exchange. Simply, they have got altered VQ as a compensatory mechanism to improve their gas exchange. So what happens when you give more and more oxygen, uncontrolled oxygen to these sort of patients? When you give uncontrolled oxygen, so you are going to release this hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So you are going to basically dilate the pulmonary vessel. So what will happen, so you are giving so then the blood flow will blood flow going blood flow is going to go going to go to increase. You are going getting more and more blood to not to the normally ventilated areas, but to chronically damaged areas. So what you are creating is what you are doing is 
you are going to get more and more dead space ventilation and you are causing more and more VQ mismatch. There's increase in VQ mismatch leading to respiratory failure. So that is the current explanation for uh, this COPD and excessive oxygen administration problem. Uh, I, I hope you uh, have got some form of understanding of this. Okay. And then, so what, are, what is the target uh, in COPD patients? So the saturation target is 88 to 92. Uh, so how, how we are going to give oxygen to a COPD patient? So we need to do control oxygen, not liberal oxygen. So the control oxygen, we can give either Venturi or we can give nasal cannula. So Venturi blue 24, Venturi 28 white, or nasal cannula. Uh, one liters, two liters, so one liter you can achieve 24, you, two liters you can go for 28. So these are the ways of giving control oxygen, simply giving control oxygen to a COPD patient, but you need to remember saturation target is 88 to 92, not 94 to 98 to 100. So, um, and also I'm going to discuss briefly about the other disease conditions um, like acute asthma. So. Our aim is to maintain saturation 94 to 98. Not saturation, we don't need saturation 100. So we need only 94 to 98. What are the ways of achieving that? You can use any of the available, I mean, oxygen delivery devices depending on the patient needs. So nasal cannula, face mask, venturi mask, high, either high flow, whatever, depending on the patient um, severity of the illness. And in acute heart failure, um, our threshold to start oxygen, our in acute heart, heart failure, based on ESC 2021 guideline, threshold to start oxygen is saturation 90%. Saturation 90%. So threshold, if patient goes, um, if patient is having low oxygen saturation below 90, so you are going to start oxygen. Your target is to maintain saturation 94 to 98. So in acute heart failure. So asthma is same 94 to 98. Heart failure threshold is 90. Uh, target is 94 to 98. Um, and other thing I need to mention, uh, if you come across a patient with heart failure, um, if patient is significantly tachypneic, um, for example, respirate more than 25, with hypoxia, saturation less than 90, if the patient is not responding to, not responding to initial measures, like uh, fusimide, GTN, uh, propping up, then it's an indication to start non-invasive ventilation in heart failure patients. So that is CPAP. So that's also you need to remember. Uh, in acute coronary syndrome, uh, ST elevation MI, ESC 2017 says, um, the threshold to start oxygen is 90. If the patient goes below 90% of saturation, so you need to start oxygen. Target is 94 to 98. You don't need 100% oxygen, 100% saturation. Why? Uh, the current literature says um, patient, uh, they are, um, the infarct size, the myocardial infarct size can um, go up. The size of the infarct can go up if you, are, if you are going to use too much oxygen in patient with acute coronary syndrome or STEMI. So the target, is 94 to 98, threshold is 90. Waste, face mask, venturi, nasal prongs, uh, CPAP or high flow, whatever depending on the patient condition. And acute ischemic stroke, so target is maintained 94 to 98. If the patient goes below 94, so you need to start oxygen. You don't need 100% 100% saturation in ischemic stroke patients. Pneumothorax also same target 94 to 98. Suppose you are going to admit 
uh, a patient with pneumothorax uh, without a tube, like you are going to admit for observation uh, with a patient with simple pneumothorax to a surgical or respiratory board, uh, basically for observation. So you can consider starting on uh, 50 liters of non-rebreather oxygen, provided that patient has, hasn't got any risk of type 2 respiratory failure, like hypercapnic respiratory failure, like uh, COPD. Uh, so what's the um, mechanism behind that? If you can remember, um, so when you give high concentration of oxygen, uh, the, one of the complications you can get is denitrogenation at a late basis. So that we are going to use in this uh, occasion as a therapeutic uh, principle. So if you give more oxygen, so the uh, in the pneumothorax, the nitrogen will be replaced by oxygen and the oxygen will be rapidly absorbed into your body. So then uh, the pneumothorax will quickly get absorbed to your body. So that's the um, theory or mechanism behind that. And other condition like pneumonia, pleurofusion, pulmonary embolism, shock, so your aim is to maintain saturation 94 to 98, not saturation of no, 100. So those are the few examples, uh, few disease conditions, I mean, commonly encountered disease condition, where you need to have a target and the threshold, and uh, you need to decide on the mode, the way you're giving oxygen, okay? So now, uh, we, I mean, I think we have, completed, like uh, briefly completed, like sort of uh, theory behind the oxygen therapy. Now we can talk, or now we can discuss our questions. So the question number one, um, so the 64 year old uh, manual worker, Present through the emergency department with shortness of breath. He has a background history of COPD with previous admissions, uh, H2 admissions for NIV, uh, no home oxygen, uh, current vital saturation 74. He's agitated, he's cyanosed, um, and respirate 45, bilateral this, tachycardic, and he's febrile. So your department was very busy. You asked uh, Miss uh, Nebula Dad Oxygen to get the Nebula scan. Padangan. So in 10 minutes time, when you, so you, you are going to see your patient and you are going to review the nurses. So nurse has done a few things. So nurse has propped up the patient. So that's very good. So any hypoxic patient, uh, you need to prop up or you need to let, uh, we need to keep the patient maximally, maximally comfortable position so that patient, like in COPD patient, we can get tripod posture. Mm -hmm. So propping, propping up any hypoxic patient that includes the patient oxygenation, so that's good. And the second thing, NASA has started 50 liters non rebreather mass, and now patient saturation is. 89%. Initially, it was 74. Uh, and the third thing NUS has done, uh, NUS has started oxygen driven nebulization. So that means uh, patient has connect, connected the uh, nebulizer, the nebulizing chamber to the oxygen cylinder or the whole oxygen. So, do you agree with her actions? What do you think about this uh, NRB? So, if you go back, so this patient, is this patient critically ill? Yes or no? Is this patient is going to die within an hour if we if are not going to start any, any treatment? This patient will die. Patient is very, very hypoxic. Patient is severely hypoxic and he's entered his high nose and he's agitated. Um, and he's very tachypnic. He's tachycardic. He's showing all the signs of hypoxia, possibly hypercarbia as well. 
So this patient is critically ill, and this patient is very, very hypoxic. So is it is it wrong to start 15 liters per minute oxygen with NRP, non-rebreather mask, for this patient? No, it's not wrong. It is not wrong to start even for a COPD patient to start oxygen via non rebreather mask if they are critically ill during the initial stages. Not for hours, but for initial few minutes or 15 minutes. So and get good saturation of at least 88, you can start 15 liters per minute um, non rebreather mask. So that's not a contraindication, even in a COPD if they are critically ill. But you are not going to go beyond 92 in this patient. That thing you need to remember. So you 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 are not going to start the non rebreather and go to the canteen and having it getting a cup of tea and come back in 30 minutes. So you need to continually monitor this patient and then you need to adjust the oxygen saturation uh, and the, the way of you are giving oxygen. So I think you I think you have got my point. So third thing that has done is oxygen even utilization. So the in COPD patients, mm -hmm. not asthma patients, COPD patients, oxygen demand driven nebulization is not recommended. So the current practice, so the current evidence-based guidelines says, so you not it's better not to start oxygen driven nebulization for COPD patients, uh, but the recommendation is you need to start air-driven air driven nebulization uh, for COPD patients, or if you want to be less COPD patients, COPD exacerbations. So uh, I hope you, you understand this clinical scenario up to now. So then um, you need the blood gas, you need the arterial blood gas while the patient on high flow. So you can, you can see these blood gas numbers. So you can see uh, the patient oxygen is 90 millimeter mercury, patient carbon dioxide is 50 millimeter mercury. Uh, and you can see bicarbonate is 32. You can see pH is 7.31. You can see lactate is 2.2. So how, how, how you are going to interpret this blood gas? So, um, so first thing you need to look at is the pH. So pH is 7.31. So you can say this patient is acidotic. So the next question, whether this patient is, patient has got respiratory acidosis or the metabolic acidosis. So let's see the respiratory uh, component. So carbon dioxide is 50. So it, it's higher than normal. So, so that it looks like patient has got respiratory acidosis. Then we will look at the bicarbonate. So it's 32. So normal bicarbonate is 22 to 26. So there's a bicarbonate elevation, bicarbonate retention as well. So what's going on this patient? So you know this patient is a COPD patient. So the COPD patients uh, have got chronic respiratory acidosis. When you have got chronic respiratory acidosis, you can get chronic CO2 elevation. Uh, sorry, chronic bicarbonate elevation as a compensatory mechanism. So that's why this patient has got elevated bicarbonate. So in summary, this patient has got respiratory acidosis and patient has got elevated bicarbonate. Looks like patient has got acute on chronic respiratory acidosis. Uh, so what's your next step? So, so far you have propagated the patient, you have given, you have started with the 50 liters, now saturation is 89, you have started oxygen, not oxygen, but uh, air driven nebulization with salbutamol and epidropium, you have given steroids. Um, so, what's the next step? So, this is a blood gas. Suppose the patient is still tachypneic and still the patient is working hard. So, what's the next step? So, the next step, you need to start in on some form of respiratory support. So you need to start him on some form of respiratory support. What's this form of respiratory support you are going to start? This patient needs 
uh, BiPAP. This patient needs BiPAP. Um, yeah, if you have got any questions, please uh, drop them into a chat function so then we can discuss them at the end. So, in summary, critical ill COPD patient can receive 100% oxygen via non rhythm mouse at the initial stages until you get good amount of saturation 80 to 92 but you are not going to go beyond 92 and this patient with copd needs air driven nebulization and if they are not respond to initial management with control oxygen with nebulization you need to do a blood gas and then you need to decide on non-invasive ventilation that is bipap that is bi-level positive air pressure uh, but for asthma patients, you can start nebulization with oxygen. It's recommended to start nebulization with oxygen. So oxygen driven nebulization for asthma patients. Okay. So we are going to discuss the next question. Uh, so it is 69 year old male uh, coming at 5 a.m. in the morning. This is a usual scenario. So the early morning shortness of breath presenters usually have heart failure that's not the rule but that happens so early morning it's rapidly worsening shortness of breath for a few hours and he's he has got low ejection fraction um so he's tachypneic with bilateral crepes and he's hypoxic on lumia he's tachycardic he's hypertensive uh with bilateral low limedema so the early morning 5 a.m you're a bit sleepy so you ask him to start oxygen and do some fusimide I know it's this final level uh, answer, but this should not be your answer for this patient. When you look at this patient, if you're not going to treat this patient, uh, so patient will die. I mean, patient will definitely die <laughs> if you're not going to treat for this patient within next 10 minutes. So you need to take, you need to see this patient early. So usually this type of patient come as category two. So you need to see the patient within 10 minutes. So you need to see this patient in the resuscitation area, like equipped area, and you need to propose this patient first to improve the patient oxygenation, hypoxia. And then how are we going to correct this patient? hypoxia so that's saturation 88 on room air so you can start in one oxygen so how are you going to start oxygen so is it nasal prone no you are not going to start nasal prone because patient died um you need to start the maximum support at the beginning and then you can de-escalate that's usually the most efficient approach to a critical patient. you need to start the maximum support at the beginning then you can de-escalate uh, when when you admit the patient so uh, you are not going to start uh, nasal prongs, you are not going to start uh, face mask pilates, you are not going to start 24% venture in this patient. So initial stage, you are going to start non rebreather with milliliters again. Or whatever the available oxygen um, the device, you can give the maximum percentage in your department. Um, because you might, there might not be uh, non rebreather available in your department. So first thing probab, you give oxygen NRP 15 liters minute, and then you need to start, or oh, at the same time, you need to start your medical measures, um, giving IV fusimide to dilate pulmonary vessels and giving IV GTN to dilate pulmonary vessels as well as to reduce the preload. Okay. So suppose, so you have started everything. You have, you have started non the You have started the uh, fusimide. You have, you have started GTN infusion, but still the patient is tachypneic to 30, 30, 30 breaths per minute. So then what I'm going to do? So, I mean, if you can remember, um, we have discussed that in acute heart failure, I don't think you have got a doubt, you have a doubt about this patient diagnosis, this patient has got acute pulmonary edema. So, uh, so is this patient need just, is this patient just need, only oxygen and medical mission. So does this patient need respiratory support like the previous COPD patient? Yes, if the patient is not responding to initial measures within first 15 minutes. So it indicated 
So the BiPAP, C, sorry, CPAP is indicated in this patient. So what are the indications to start CPAP in acute pulmonary edema? So ESC guidelines says you need to start as soon as possible. And bacteria saturation less in it respirate more than 24. So I mean, patient has already fulfilled those criteria. So you, this patient needs CPAP if, he, if he's not responding to initial measures. So that is the uh, management of heart failure, initial heart failure. So the third question, um, case number three, you have got 40 year old male, ED with fever, cough, shortness of breath for a few days. Uh, he's confused, he's tachypneic, he's hypoxic, even on non with the 50 liters. He's got bilateral, sorry, right vessel crepitation. He's tachycardic, luckily his blood pressure is stable, he's febrile. So your clinical diagnosis, right side, pneumonia. I don't think you have got a right about that. It's very easy to diagnose. But is he suitable to go to the ward after initial treatment? No, he needs to go to ICU or HTU. So you have planned to send him to ICU, but it's three hour drive. So then you, is this patient uh, suitable to transport without intubation? No, he's very hypoxic. He's going to die. to be this patient. This is just uh, keeping the patient flat on a trolley and keeping the NRB on the patient's face and asking us to get ready with the um, intubation uh, equipment, Macintosh, and other patients give some midazolam and saxamethonium. Completely ignoring the patient's saturation and the other vital parameters, giving just sucks and medicine and putting the tube should not be your approach. Because this patient is critically ill during your intubation, this level of critical hypoxia can lead to cardiac arrest. So you want to, do you want to kill this 40 years old man coming with simple pneumonia? Do you want to kill this patient by putting a tube? You will be able to put the tube because you are competent, but you won't be able to save this patient. So you need to correct hypoxia prior to tubing. So how are you going to correct hypoxia? What are the ways of correcting hypoxia in this patient? So uh, I'm going to give you a bit of complex congested um, slide. So, uh, um, just a simple question. How many oxygen cylinders do you need to manage this patient? At least you need to have two oxygen cylinders, two oxygen regulators to intubate this patient. At least you need to. Um, so the first thing, as we discussed, so we need to prop up this patient to improve patient lung capacity and improve oxygenation. And the second thing, you need to put an acid from this patient. But don't um, start oxygen, but put the nasal pumps. And then uh, you can attach the attach your non rebreather mask. And open up the regulator to 50. No, at least 50, but you can open up more and more, then you can get much more, much greater uncalibrated flow. I think you got my point. Um, so you prop up, you put the nasal prongs and but you are not going to connect the nasal prongs to oxygen. Uh, or you can connect, but you are not going to open up. And then you put the nasal prongs uh, so we have put the non rebreather and start the maximum amount of flow you can give to the non rebreather mask. And then you are going to monitor this patient for a few minutes. So your target is aiming saturation more than 98 prior to intubation. Um, suppose with propping up with non rebreather 
I mean, this patient already on non rebreather you didn't do any additional thing. I don't think you will be able to achieve more than 98. So then, are we going to intubate without achieving saturation 98? Or are we going to achieve and intubate? So, what are the ways of achieving? What are the additional measures we can do? We have got two or three options. So you can start him on CPAP. You can start him on CPAP with good P, with good uh, P, like 10, 12, to improve his oxygenation. Or you can start him on high flow nasal cannula. Start with 46 liters a minute with 100% oxygen. So that's the other way. Or else, if you don't, if you, if you, if you do not have any of these machines in your department, you can get the back and mask, you can get the ambu back. You can attach the PPAL without PPAL is difficult. You need to put the PPAL because you need this patient needs a big high peak. So get the ambu, close the PPAL, uh, and then slowly ambu and let the patient with 100% to achieve 98, at least 19% saturation. Uh, and then you can proceed to intubate this. Patient. Otherwise, you are going to kill this patient. So, why why do we need to achieve why do we need to achieve this ninety eight target or higher amount of saturation target prior to intubate this sort of critical ill patient? Because we need to denitrogenate lungs. We need to increase. We need to enhance the safe period of apnea um, in this sort of critical ill patient. So. You and me, we have got roughly one minute safe period of apnea. But if you denitrogenate them, if you if you um, fill their lungs, if you fill their blood with oxygen, then we can enhance the safe period of ap apnea to at least five to six minutes. So that's our aim because if you're not going to enhance or lengthen the patient's safe period of apnea, and if you are going to start, if you are going to intubate this patient with saturation 90, next minute patient will drop his saturation to 85. And then you, you if you can remember oxygen dissociation curve, curve, patient will go into the steep part, then patient will rapidly deteriorate and patient will get a cardiac arrest then you are in trouble. So that's the pre-oxygenation period. Then, so you have, you are going to do uh, sedatives, you are going to do paralytics, and then, so during, when you, when you, when you give paralytics, the patient is stop breathing. So during this apneic period, apneic period, until the patient get fully, full paralysis for a minute. So what can we do? We can start Apneic oxygenation. So, what's this apneic oxygenation? So, if you can remember at the beginning, I have a nasal cannula, but we haven't started oxygen. So, now it's time to start oxygen 15 liters a minute. 15 liters a minute nasal oxygen uh, during this apnea period. Is this going to, um, does this going to help the patient? Yes. Although you haven't got uh, any respiratory movement because you have stopped the patient breathing, still oxygen can diffuse the patient's blood. So the roughly, if you are, when you are giving 15 liters a minute nasal from oxygen during apnea period, uh, 250 ml of oxygen can diffuse into your blood. So that's a good amount of oxygen. Okay, so that's called apneic oxygenation. And then you can put the tube and then you can connect the patient to the ventilator. So that's how, we, how um, you are going to intubate this critically ill hypoxic pneumonia patient. In summary, prop up, put the nasal cannula, put the uh, non rebreather open up the maximum flow. If you can't achieve, get the CPAP, get high flow. Or if you don't have, if you have, if you have nothing, start back and now with the peak well closed, get the saturation 98 and give paralytics and uh, sedatives, and then um, um, start apneic oxygenation, then you put the tube, then you connect to the ventilator. 
I have discussed only the correct, only correcting hypoxia, but we need to think of the patient hemodynamics parameters as well. That is tachycardia and blood pressure, so heart rate and blood pressure. So I'm not going to discuss the heart rate and blood pressure management um, during this peri-intubation period in this patient. I have discussed only the correcting hypoxia. I hope you you have you got some some form of understanding how you should approach to this sort of critical ill hypoxic patient. Okay, now uh, we'll go to the case number four. You have got a four month old infant with bronchiolitis RSV related. That's a common presentation. Uh, so the infant coming in bronchiolitis. Uh, so uh, when you look at the patient respiratory parameters, patient is hypoxic um, with saturation line 89, rumia, and is tachypnic, subcostal resistance, nasal frail, bilateral crackers. So I would consider this patient is in severe respiratory distress. And luckily, um, she's not in a shock. She's tachycardic, but capability is good. I assume that she's not in a lot of shock. Uh, generally, when you look at the patient, it's still alert, but mother's fever is less than 50 percent of normal. So, how do you correct hypoxia this kid? So, I think coming to a diagnosis in this patient is not a problem. So, you can control this patient as what severe bronchiolitis. So, how do you correct hypoxia? Are we going to just sorry, so are we going to put a face mask and send the send this patient to the ward, pediatric ward? Or are we going to start oxygen on with the venturi? No, I don't think. This kid also critically ill patient patient is in severe respiratory distress. So uh, at the beginning, as for any critical patient, so you are going to start pediatric um, non breather and then what do you think? Would non breather mask help for this patient respiratory distress? I don't think. But hmm? Uh, might help to some extent, but not for the, to complete. So this patient needs some form of respiratory support. So in bronchiolitis, the patient has got severe respiratory distress uh, with hypoxia. So that's indication to start high flow, high flow nasal cannula. Oh, uh, yeah. So that I mean, if this patient comes to your ED, I think that should be your approach and then patient needs H2 admission. Um, okay, so that's the case number four. So uh, just briefly mention about high flow nasal cannula. So the high flow nasal cannula, uh, high flow nasal oxygen, so it's it's a way to provide very high flow with 100% oxygen. And uh, the occasions we can use in pediatrics, you can use uh, um, for bronchiolitis, it's evidence based and also pediatric asthma, but it's not fully evidence based, but still some centers they are using. And in adults, for any forms of form of hypoxia, hypoxia not transforming to a conventional measures, you can go for high flow. Um, that's for disease conditions and as it is and, and uh, after extubation, uh, or I mean, any form of hypoxic state. You can use high flow if the patient clinical condition uh, permits to start that, or else sometimes you might go for intubation. Okay, that's case number four. Case number five. Uh, I think this will be the last question. Um, so this you have got 70, uh, 70 kilogram man was intubated due to type one respiratory failure following pneumonia, you're going to transfer this patient to nearest ICU. This is one hour away. So your ventilator setting is 500 milliliters tidal volume and you've got respiratory rate of 12 and you have got the FIO2, the inspired oxygen percentage of 0.5, 50%. Uh, 
and you have got transport oxyglobulin related. Uh, attendant is asking, uh, sir, what size, what size of oxygen cylinder um, you need? Um, so, what size do you need? You don't know. So then, um, you ask the, the attendant, um, healthcare worker, take the cylinder, what do you have? Then what happened in the middle of the day? <laughs> so, uh, then the ventilator start beeping because of failure of oxygen. That means there's no oxygen. So what two things can happen. One thing is anyway patient is going to deteriorate. That's the first thing. Sometimes patient can die. And you need to rush to a, one of the closest hospitals to get down, to beg, to beg actually, to beg uh, oxygen, one of the failed oxygen cylinder. So in this question, I'm going to discuss how, how are you going to calculate, how you are going to calculate um, the amount of oxygen you need for the transport. So uh, suppose your patient is not intubated, not on a ventilator, but he's getting some form of oxygen through the face mask. So uh, suppose your patient is on 10 liters per minute, uh, 10 liters per minute uh, face mask, and you need to transfer this patient to CT room, uh, suppose it's a head injury patient. So it's on 10 liters face mark, uh, CT room is 15 minutes away. So, so how, uh, how many liters does this patient needs to transport to the CT room? So 10 liters per minute, 15 minutes. So you need 150 liters for, for 15 minutes. But I mean, that's only to, to reach there, but you need to come back. So you double them. So it is uh, 300 liters. So it's 300, so you need 300 liters of oxygen. So um, then what size of cylinder you need? Uh, do you know about that? Oh, it's a jumbo cylinder or oh, I don't know. You should know, otherwise you are in trouble. Uh, so uh, and the second example, uh, our question. So, um, how are we going to calculate uh, ox the, the oxygen amount for a ventilated patient? It's the same. So, um, if you can see the top, so two means you need to, that means you need to double or less because you are thinking of getting the patient back to your ED again. So, transport time in minutes. So it's, you know, it's one hour and within bracket to so the minute ventilation. So the minute ventilation is the uh, amount of um, air you need for a minute. So his tidal volume is 500 ml and his respirator is 12. So 500 is 12 is 6,000, that's six liters, six liters. So he need six liters of air for medical gas um, for a minute, but he's, but he's getting only 50% of 50 oxygen. So what is the amount of oxygen out of these six liters you need is 50, sorry, uh, 0.5 into 6,000. So he needs three liters of oxygen per minute. He needs three liters of oxygen per minute. Uh, and for any ventilator, there's a thing called bias flow. Bias flow, B-I-A-S, bias flow. Bias flow means, so uh, you need to give uh, some form of oxygen flow to the ventilator for its proper functioning. So bias flow depends on the ventilator type. So for oxygen, the bias flow is 0.5 liters per minute. So patient needs three liters per minute and ventilator needs 0.5 liters per minute. So it's 3.5 liters a minute. And you have got 120 minutes because you are going to go
go there and take the patient back. So you need to have a double. So you have 120 meters into 3.5. So it is 420 liters. So this patient needs 400, roughly 420 liters for your transport. So what the size of cylinder you need. So then you need to know the size of the cylinders. I mean, you don't have to remember the numbers and everything, but you need to have a rough um, idea about the amount of oxygen uh, in a cylinder. So if you are, if you if uh, your healthcare worker thinks that this very small cylinder uh, is enough, you need to explain him that this patient needs at least uh, how much? 420 liters. So these two cylinders are not going, are not going to help. So at least you need this cylinder called E cylinder uh, to transport this patient. The, e is, the, the height of D cylinder is like to your knee level. So if you if you if you come across a cylinder uh, which uh, which has a height up to your knee level, roughly it's a D cylinder. And if you come across a cylinder um, that has a height up to your hip level, that's roughly E cylinder. E cylinder. And other cylinders, is, I mean, you are not going to transport with the jumbo cylinder. So then you need to get another ambulance to transport this cylinder. So roughly uh, D and E cylinders, uh, or sometimes F cylinders, would help. For the transport, so uh, that's rough guidance. How how much oxygen you need to transport, and uh, how we are going to select the oxygen cylinder uh, for your transport. So, because many patients, uh, not many actually. Um, I mean, I have seen so the patients. Uh, it's or getting more and more sicker or deteriorate because of lack of lack of oxygen due to improper selection of oxygen cylinder sizes. Okay. So uh, I think we are coming to end of the presentation. So this is the um, basic summary or the algorithm. Um, the way of the, the how you should start oxygen in emergency department. This is a rough, like a rough algorithm, might be from the BTS guideline 2017. Uh, when you look at left top, is this patient critically ill or ill patient in perianus condition? Yes, this patient needs NRB 50 liters a minute or the maximum amount of oxygen you can give, you need to start. Then you get the his saturation up. Uh, to either 88 to 92 or 94 to 98. I mean, there you need to think of, is this patient at risk of hypercapnic respiratory failure? Is this patient as good COPD? So then you need to de-escalate, de-escalate your oxygen therapy to targeting saturation 88 to 92. Uh, if the patient hasn't got any risk factors, then you can aim for saturation 94 to 98. So any critical ill patient, uh, starting non renal is not a contraindication at initial stages, even in a COPD patient, but you need to de-escalate once you uh, get his saturation up. So that's the basic summary of this slide. Uh, I think um, we have come to the end of this lecture. So uh, in summary, I mean, first, the basic principle in the medicine is do no harm. So giving too much oxygen or giving little oxygen, both are harmful. You don't need saturation 100% always. And oxygen is not the treatment for tachypnea provided that patient saturation is normal. So the tachypnea, treatment for tachypnea is not oxygen provided that patient has got good saturation. 
Treatment of tachypnea, the patient is hypoxic at initial stages. Yes, it's oxygen, but patient might need some form of, or you need to consider starting him on some form of respiratory support if the patient's tachypnea is not improving. Like in COPD, it's BiPAP, it's in heart failure, it's CPAP, in bronchiolitis, it's high flow. That depends on the patient condition. Uh, and um, we have discussed some clinical scenarios and we have discussed uh, the oxygen transport oxygen calculation. So I think we have come to the end of this lecture. Uh, I hope you have got some understanding or I have improved your knowledge. I mean, that's good. If you have got any questions, uh, I mean, I think that the, this is the time to ask or um, you can contact me via the email uh, to my email. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir. We have quite yeah. a few questions received from the audience. Uh, yeah. We might have time to discuss a few of them. Uh, yeah. The first question is, uh, for how long is it recommended to use a non-rebreather mask? I mean, there's no um, rough guidance. So the teaching is, if your patient is uh, in shock, until you correct the patient shock, you need to, you can continue non-rebreather oxygen. Uh, in COPD patient, if this patient is critically ill, could be due to two reasons. One, it could be due to COPD related reasons. One, it could be due to something else, like COPD patient can come in. Um, septic shock. So in these two categories, uh, for COPD patient, so initially if they are critically ill or periodic, you can start non rebreather And once you get their saturation, up to around 88 to 92, then uh, you need to de-escalate his oxygen um, supplementation uh, either to uh, venturi or either to uh, nasal prongs, uh, something like that. But there, there are no hard and fast rules um, mentioning or indicating that this is the, the maximum time you can use high flow. But when you have correct, when you have treated the critical illness, when you have correct uh, shock, when you have treated the sepsis, um, when you have treated the um, COPD exacerbation, then you need to de-escalate because we know hyperoxia is also going to kill this patient, basically due to oxidative stress or free radical uh, related damage. Uh, yes. Uh, so the next question, it's uh, more of a practical question. If there is a patient presenting with epilepsy, is there yes. a place for oxygen prophylactically, even if the patient is maintaining around 92 to 94% of SpO2 during the fitting episode? Okay. Um, during the fitting episode, I mean, there are, there are no like hard evidence um, with regards to oxygen therapy. But current recommendation is to maintain the patient saturation between 94 to 98, provided that patient has put no risk factors for hypercapnic respiratory failure. So, but achieving 100% oxygen is not recommended during fitting attack. So you need only 94 to 98. Um, so the next question that the audience wants to know if you can explain the denitrogenation effect that becomes advantageous in pneumothorax. Yes, the, the denitrogenation effect is, uh, so it's the concept is called denitrogenation uh, or resorption uh, related uh, shrinking. So, so you know, uh, when you have got a pneumothorax, the composition of the pneumothorax, the composition of the air in the pneumothorax is um, same as 
the other the, the normal atmospheric ice is more contain nitrogen and it contain less oxygen so if you give more oxygen to a pneumothorax patient what will happen so uh, this nitrogen will be replaced uh, by oxygen uh, so the, this oxygen will quickly get absorbed into our body so then there's the shrinking there's a, um, like a, uh, the, the volume of the pneumothorax will um, be reduced so that's what, that's the basis of starting oxygen uh, for undrained pneumothorax so that's um, like well explained in uh, bts guidelines 2017 the next question, sir. Shouldn't we start oxygen in all patients coming with acute coronary syndrome and stroke despite the saturation as a supportive measure? No, no. I mean, I think we have discussed uh, that question already. So acute STEMI, saturation myocardial infarction. So the recommendation to start, the threshold to start is 90%. So the target is to maintain 94 to 98 uh yeah so that's the uh, current recommendation i mean this can change later because of the new evidence but the current recommendation is that because there's a risk of increasing impact size in a in my acute myocardial infarction patients if you are going to give too much oxygen that's the theory behind that uh, the next question sir why oxygen driven nebulization is not recommended in copd uh, because in COPD, so when you, if you, if you want to do oxygen driven nebulization, you need to start at least, at least six liters of minute, hundred percent oxygen. Um, so you need to dial up the oxygen regulator at least to six, six liters per minute, and you are going to give six liters per minute oxygen via tubing to the nebulization. Chain. So the nebulization chain is attached to the um, nebulization mask. So, but nobody knows the exact amount of oxygen percentage, exact amount of FiO2, exact amount of inspired oxygen percentage patient is receiving with these six liters. And we know. This patient, this COPD patient, uh, do not or they are not uh, benefited from uncontrolled oxygen therapy because of um, they are because of not they are hypoxic, right? Because of they are derangement of VQ uh, mismatch. So, question for your answer: and, uh, giving uh, nebulization with uh, oxygen. So we don't know about the oxygen percentage and we are giving uncontrolled oxygen. So that is not good in COPD patient. So that's the basic theory, but for asthma patient, um, so you can, uh, asthma, asthma hypoxic patient, asthma hypoxic patient, you can give oxygen driven nebulization because oxygen is not going to harm uh, in COPD, sorry, asthma, moderate severe asthma patients. Um, one more question, sir. Just like yeah. in question number one, we discussed, our audience want to know how do we decide between BiPAP and CPAP for a patient? So, uh, BiPAP and CPAP are, um, actually, they come under the umbrella term called non-invasive ventilation. Uh, non-invasive ventilation, is uh, provision of providing positive pressure ventilation, providing positive pressure ventilation uh, to a patient without putting a tube, without uh, putting a basically a tube. So that is called non-invasive ventilation. So invasive ventilation is providing positive pressure ventilation with tube to a tube. So that's basic difference between NIV and IMB. So NIV, uh, basically you have got two options. One is CPAP, other one is BiPAP. 
So the, um, so the question was, what are the indications or how we are going to start CPAP, how we are going to start BiPAP? So what are the indications? CPAP, uh, if, if it's a simple way to remember, is CPAP basically correct your hypoxia. Okay, BiPAP uh, usually correct your hypoxia a little, hypercarbia, that is CO2 retention a lot. So that's the basic difference. So going back to CPAP again, so the, the evidence based recommendation for CPAP uh, in critical ill patients is basically like for uh, heart failure patient with type 1 respiratory failure. So EC guidelines recommend uh, to start CPAP uh, for, for patients coming with acute heart failure, if uh, your initial measures, if your initial measures starting in NRB, giving LASIKs, giving DTN, the, the, the medical treatment, if the patient is not responding to your initial measures, like within 15 minutes, then if still the patient has got uh, respiratory distress, like signs of significant work of breathing, uh, respirate more than 24, saturation less than 90. So those are the indications to start CPAP in patient with uh, heart failure. But any other hypoxic patient like pneumonia, uh, asthma, or pre-intubation, pre-oxygenation, so still you can start CPAP, but they are not um, like very well evidence-based. And when you talk about BiPAP, the usual recommendation is uh, to start BiPAP in COPD. It's very, very well um, recommended guideline-based treatment for COPD excavation. So the indication to start BiPAP in COPD patient so you need to start your initial management. So you need to start your control oxygen. You need to start your nebulization. You need to start your steroid. You need to start your antibiotic if indicated. Provided that you have started your initial measures and within one hour of medical treatment, if the patient still has got significant respiratory distress uh, as evidenced by respirate more than 24 plus uh, blood gas evidence of respiratory um, respiratory acidosis that is pH less than 7.35 with carbon dioxide of 45 millimeters of mercury. So that's the indication to start BiPAP uh, in COPD patient. So, but you need to think of the contraindications and the ceiling of care when you start BiPAP in COPD patient. So, uh, and I'm not going to discuss those things, but these are basically two uh, scenarios and the indications uh, where you need CPAP and BiPAP. If you need me to explain the, uh, the physiology behind the CPAP and BiPAP, uh, please let me know. Uh, I will be able to explain it to you. So, unfortunately, that's the time we have for questions today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if anyone has any questions, uh, we kindly ask the audience to forward it to us at Sri, and we will be able to forward your questions to Dr. Kamir Bopetta and get some answers for all your queries. Um, with that, thank you very much, sir, for today's lecture and joining with us this Sunday morning and giving that very insightful and concise uh, lecture on a very important topic and a very important therapy we use in our daily practice. Um, our audience, thank you again for your participation, for coming together every Sunday. We hope to see you again next Sunday uh, with another new lecturer, with another topic. Please don't forget to uh, fill your feedback forms to receive your e-certificate. Our lecture recording will be available in our YouTube channel within this week for anyone who missed or had any connection problems while trying to attend for this lecture. Uh, wishing you all a very happy Sunday and a very blessed week. Thank you all from us here at Sri. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.
I hope you got something out of the lecture, and I hope you you would uh, use them uh, from your next shift in your hospital. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. Thank you, sir. Thank you.